All right, let's have a look at how we're doing in the Hargreaves Lansdowne platform. It's been a couple of months since I did an update on this one. My one of the first times I've actually looked into seeing this portfolio. After having a quick recap back at the last video, we were at 47,000 241. And in dollars, if you are watching this from the States or someone else, that is $59,397. Now, I've got no idea what it is right now. So let's go and have a look. So one of the first things we'll notice is there is a lot of red out there. And of course, things are still going a bit crazy out there in the marketplace. We've just seen a dip that's kept on dipping. Of course, we've got the S&P 500 all the way down. The Nasdaq's taking a massive hit. The FTSE 100 has actually uh, survived, which is not too bad at the moment, but it hasn't exactly gone anywhere fast. Now you can see the total value of the account down there is 43,823. And it's of course going to change on me as soon as I say that, but around that kind of mark, there is actually some cash in the account because we've just been paid a dividend. I will touch on that one later, but let's go kind of from bottom to top, to talk about our biggest losers and biggest winners so far in the account. So right at the bottom is our good old friend there, Evraz. Now, if you know anything about what's been going on in the rest of the world in the stock market at the moment, Evraz is a London listed miner, which obviously operates outside of Russia and Ukraine. So at the moment it is delisted and you cannot trade this stock at all. So the last value in the account is what it was last traded at, but there's no trades going on at the moment. Now, the majority shareholder was of course Roman Abramovich, um, he's kind of in lockdown at the moment or probably having most of his assets seized. Who knows what's going to happen with this company? I think at this point, we've just got to take this as a big L because I really can't see this one now coming back. It's a real shame actually because the company was going to pay out some healthy dividends and there was a demerger that was happening at the same time, which would have also given me quite a bit of healthy profit here. Because back when this was actually trading at decent levels, my yield on cost, I actually got it for a really good price and I was getting huge amounts of dividends from, from this uh, stock itself. So now that's not taken place, ultimately there is just a lesson that anything can happen in the stock market. So I'm glad I didn't have all of my eggs in one basket. I'm gonna learn the lesson of course is, although I thought it was a solid company with solid financials, there are other risks to take into account. And of course we couldn't have foreseen what's gonna happen, but I think I'll stick to UK and US listed stocks that don't operate in strange countries for the time being. Anyway, just gotta consider that one now. Who knows what's gonna happen? We'll keep ourselves updated with that one. Who knows? Next up in the loser category is Bailey Gifford American. This is one of the most popular funds of the last couple of years because pretty much it's got all of your hype and tech stocks in, which benefited massively from the COVID run up. So in fact, I'll go inside this one now for you. I'm down 45% on this fund. I actually dollar cost averaged into this fund. So let's have a look at the performance section of the fund. You can see it's had an amazing few years. Very similar, I would say, to Kathy Wood's ARC fund. And of course, look, 35% in 2017, 7.5% during 2018, 2019, and then nearly 50% and above 50% in the last couple of years. But of course, it's given back nearly 50% of those earnings. It is a fund that costs you a bit of money. You can see the charges here of 0.31%. But more important, if we just scroll down, you can see what the top 10 holdings are. And of course, again, like we've just said, it's very much benefited from that huge run up, especially in companies like Tesla. But look, all the companies here, Moderna, Shopify's taken huge hits. Nvidia is doing pretty well, but it's still down from all time highs. And of course, things like the trade desk as well, also taken massive hits. It's heavily focused. If we look at the sectors, it's all about technology and bio and pharmaceutical. And of course, um, what happened in 2020 that caused those stocks to go up? Well, you know the rest of the story. But I think the problem here, of course, is going to be what happened to these funds in the future. As we've always said with managed funds, no one knows what's going to happen with them long term. It's extremely difficult to beat the market. I think the fund, of course, got a lot of hype and a lot of attention because of its performance figures. Everyone wanted a piece of that action. And I think the problem with any managed fund, the problem with this kind of fund is that people get hyped up when they see the performance of the year before and they just assume that it's going to keep going. Now, I'm, of course, don't have to sell anything and don't have to move away from it. But of course, that is going to take a long time to get those gains back. And remember, if you're nearly down 50%, you've actually got to get 100% gain just to get yourself back up. So I think in the long term, absolutely, I would have confidence in those companies, but they're all out of favor at the moment, of course, as the world worries about increased costs of borrowing with interest rates and inflation out of control. So 
who knows, I won't be selling, but it is a very disappointing holding in the account at the moment. Jumping up to another managed fund, I think there's a bit of a theme here. I should just pick my own stocks. The Global Clean Energy Fund, that's had a huge um, roller coaster ride. You can see it's down 18% in the account at the moment. I think at one point that was more than 40% down. This, of course, if we dive into it, is just a collection of different clean energy companies and companies that generate their electricity or operating in that space as well. So you will see companies, I think like Enphase and Chargepoint, if I'm not mistaken, but let's go and have a look here. So we've got Enphase there, Plug Power, SSE. So you, there are some big established brands here as well as being much smaller ones looking to do up and coming. It does pay a small dividend as well. I did get um, a very small amount of money from this, uh, from this holding as well. Again, it's a long-term holding, so we'll have to go and see what actually happens with it in that much longer term. Don't have to sell it, but I think it is in one of those other lessons that says it's extremely difficult to find managed funds or anyone putting together a fund for you in an ETF that's actively managed to beat that market in the long term. But we are focused long term, so this is just very much a short-term thinking. And of course, this is the trap that you can fall into and you can end up selling everything and losing a lot of money. So I'm not going to do that. Next up, this one should just get sold and put in the waste bin, really. Deliveroo. So if you didn't watch my last portfolio update, this was just a purely speculative bet. Um, I managed to get shares pre-IPO because I actually I emailed out to all customers and said, you can have a maximum of £1,000. So I was like, right, I'll just put £1,000 into it thinking uh, the IPO market was ridiculously hot. It's going to probably get some overblown valuations. I'll make some quick money. And the opposite happened. So that's a very good lesson learned that not to play in the IPO market in the first place because it's just ridiculous. The company, of course, isn't making a profit, but it is growing very quickly. Yes, we know that fast last mile delivery of convenience goods and foods is going to be the future. It costs a lot of money to run these companies and they burn through a hell of a lot. And you will see probably on your local high streets or up and down your um, local takeaways, all of the different brands popping up now as well. So it's a hugely competitive space and a very interesting one. But is it going to deliver shareholder value? I don't know. I think for now, though, I'll keep it on the list as a company that just reminds me of my stupidity and to not do that again. If I sold, I could put this into probably anything and get better returns. Because again, remember what we said, because it's down 76%, I would have to kind of triple my money just to get back to level. So that's not a good position to be in. Don't worry, we're nearly at the winning one. So Unilever's had an interesting one, of course. You'll know this big old beast of a consumer goods company producing lots of different brands and household goods that you probably have in your house, in your kitchen, in your bathroom at the moment. Now, they saw a big rise in their price rise this week and the share price, it was a 9% jump, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and that news was because the billionaire investor, Mr. Nelson Pelt, has now joined the board. And if you don't know much about Nelson, I didn't in the first place, so I had to do my own little research in the background of him. He actually owns 1.5% of Unilever through his active hedge fund, Try and Fund Management. And his manoeuvre does suggest that the company will be looking to potentially break up some of its different business units. And there has been a huge amount of pressure on this company to actually just do something because over the past five years, and certainly over the past couple of years, it's not really had any benefit, any share price gain from the bull market that we've been through. So shareholders are thinking, okay, what's going on here? Where's our money? All these brands they sell. Um, so that share price rise reflects the fact that Nelson Peltz is highly likely to put pressure on the company to make those changes. And he's also on the compensation committee as well in terms of making sure that the CEO and senior people get paid aligning to kind of shareholder goals as well. Oh, also in random fact, his daughter married Brooklyn Beckham. So pelts, that obviously all links together. This is definitely a long-term hold. I'm disappointed like a lot of shareholders in Unilever that hasn't necessarily done anything. Um, even if it had a small gain over the past couple of years, that would have been quite nice. Yes, it is a dividend payer if we go in here and check the latest um, dividend yield on the account. I think it's um, it's around four or five percent. Here we are, 3.87%. So it's nothing substantial, but if it grow that dividend and keep that dividend while also growing a kind of at the rate of inflation, that would be quite a nice return and a nice solid company to balance out your portfolio. And now let's look at some of the companies that are actually in the green or in the blue, as you can see on the Hargreaves Lansdowne screen. Apple up at 30%, which is doing quite nicely. The company just on an unstoppable rise. Seemingly everyone needs new Apple stuff. The ecosystem is just kind of unbeatable as I record this on my MacBook with my iPhone in front of me and an iPad and half a dozen or so other Apple devices in this, uh, in this house alone. We know the company makes a hell of a lot of money. It's all going to be the question though really is can the company continue to grow and continue to expand its cash basis and continue generating free cash flow more than the market. And I think once the companies get really, really big, that's always my concern is that 
Can it outgrow, at least outgrow its share price better than the rest of the market? And would my money be better off just in an index fund? And that is always a question you've got to balance up with some of these stocks, but nice results nonetheless. Now jumping up more into the tech world, AMD, um, phenomenal company, of course, who makes graphics chips, processors, and all the other different devices like ASICs as well. Um, this company, of course, has seen a huge run up over the past few years, has a huge benefit as well from the mining craze, but also the fact that their chips and their Ryzen processors and Epic processors are phenomenal tools for both consumers and businesses. I run an AMD chip myself in my system. And I know, of course, over the years, they've always been battling Intel for that top spot. And at the moment, I think it's safe to say that they are smashing Intel to pieces with their architecture and with their technology. They did announce some strong results last month. Their revenue was up 71% for the year. Gross margins were 48%. Now they were slightly down in the operating margins, but they were much more well insulated than Nvidia was. And I'll touch on them in a moment, but I am pleased about AMD and I think they're gonna to continue to grow massively in this space. Legal in general, you can see, continues to tick along nicely. They're the one who's just paid a nice little dividend to me. I think that was um, several hundred pounds in the account they've just paid. So I do have that cash there. Some great results there from Legal in general. If you can find a company that can pay you a dividend and also grow at 30%, at least in terms of share price, then you're onto a winner. And it's a good company to hold, in my opinion. Now, some of the big boys, of course, NVIDIA third place up 40%. Now, if I remind myself from the last update, they have still taken a bit of a fall. They were up 70% um, and AMD was actually up 48% in my last portfolio update. They did have a great crazy quarter though, in terms of their revenue. They were up 46% on those, some seriously impressive growth, but they were affected by supply chain shortages and the Russia-Ukraine conflict too. Now, you can also see from their results that they did have a much larger jump in their operating costs, which actually went up twice compared to their revenue. So, and this is something that's always worth reminding yourself as an investor, if revenues increase 100% every quarter or every year, that's great. But if my costs increase more than that, 200%, 300%, for example, then of course the value of the company really is going in the wrong direction. And of course, if they're constantly losing money, that's not a good look to be in. So that is something obviously to be aware of, but again, they make a very high margin product very similar to AMD in that space. It's all really gonna be now a question of valuation of Nvidia is gonna be a fantastic company moving forward. It just depends now of how much you want to pay for that growth. And finally, in terms of our top two positions, this is absolutely flipped now. So this just shows the volatility in the kind of world we're in at the moment. So Tesla, um, although it's not my biggest position by um, actual cash, it's my second largest position in terms of percentage gain. So I'm up 77% of my position with Tesla. I own seven shares of the company. At one point, it was my biggest gain. I was up over 90%. But of course, all we know is that the company has gone from $1,200 to around um, $700 mark that it is at the moment. This one will remain a long-term position for me. As I mentioned before, I'm not some massive, crazy Tesla bull or Elon Musk fanboy so that I just don't care what the valuations are. I think the valuations are extremely important on this company but it does have to deliver exceptional quarter on quarter growth and some exceptional numbers basically forever because with these valuations, there is a hell of a lot baked in. Now I have run my own uh, pricing on the company. I have my, run my own very basic DCF model, which I probably will run through at some point, but there's a lot of perfection baked in. Anything can happen, right? But with difficult times ahead, we have to remember what sector it operates in. There's only a certain number of kind of wealthier people who can afford electric cars regardless of whether electric cars are the future, an electric car still has to replace someone else's car and someone else's internal combustion vehicle. All of the other areas of their business, like energy storage and autonomous driving, for example, robo taxis, until they actually make some money from those, they're all just uh, things that you can wish for. So very much if you're a story investor, you can go for that, but I need to see some revenue before you can just tell me how rosy the future is. No surprise though now, taking the top spot in terms of percentage gain is BP. So I'm up 115% on this position. I did get BP for a fantastic price looking back, but it wasn't necessarily down to skill. It was just because I wanted to make sure I get some beaten down stocks. And the thing with companies like BP, of course, operating in the sector that they do, I knew that the commodity of oil and the you know, energy production, of course, is gonna, it's gonna be very cyclical. It's gonna have its day and it's gonna come back again. The issue I have now, and this is actually one potentially on the chopping block, and you might think this is counterintuitive, but I th I'm thinking of taking some profits in BP, if not ditching the position entirely. And let me just tell you a couple of reasons why I think that is. Firstly, I think there is negative sentiment toward energy producing companies. They're seen to be profit making, of course, which apparently is, is terrible. All the other companies can make loads of money. Apple can rip you off for an iPhone, but anytime uh, oil goes up, of course, these companies are seen to be profiting massively. And what a lot of people forget is, of course, that profit needs to be reinvested back into the business. Now, if you're going to tax a company heavily, 
and you're going to take away the times when they manage to make profit during good times, that does concern me when the times are bad that you're not in investing into the infrastructure. And then also, if I don't take profits during the good times, then what about the bad times when ultimately the share price will drip down? Now, that's not to say I don't think the company has um, legs in it. And I think that could, of course, if you look at the previous share price, although it's not necessarily something you should do, if you do look at it over the longer term across five years, potentially this stock has a long, long way still to run up. Of course, I think it nearly touched um, 600p a share compared to where it is at the moment. So there is some definitely legs there. But I have to balance it up with if I did sell this position, I would probably invest in a couple of other positions which have been beaten down. And the kind of positions I'd be looking at investing in, I think I would like a bit more exposure compared to my Lightyear account, which is another portfolio you can have a look at. The likes of Google, um, the likes of PayPal, I think it's been beaten down and potentially meta platforms as well. Um, I know that would be more heavily concentrated into the tech sector, but I think there's a lot more growth there. And I think at the valuations they're currently at and some of the projections that I've been doing, I would be much more confident to allocate the money there. So do let me know your thoughts if you stayed this far on BP, which is on the chopping block. There's no rush to do this, but I genuinely think it's time to take profits on that. That will be enough on the table. And I can also then just even take a portion of that and stick that into my ISA, into the S&P 500, because is, B is BP going to deliver more than the market? It's really hard to say because it's going to rely so heavily on the commodity and the price of oil and the price of energy, which I think is going to stay um, you know, bad for a long time. I don't think the uh, problems are going to sort themselves out for, for a while. But I think taking some profit might be good on that one. But let me know what you think. But I'll probably take it out of Hargoose Lansdowne anyway, because I don't want to pay uh, £12 a trade to buy all the other positions. Anyway, I hope that hasn't been too long for you and been interesting. Do let me know your thoughts below. If you do want to have a look at any of my other portfolios, there is a description, a link in the description, I should say, with all of them. So, of course, I've got a dividend portfolio on free trade. I've got my ISA and SIP, which is on Vanguard. And I've got a nice little new tech portfolio I'm building up on Lightyear as well. So take have a look at them. Now, we'll be doing some future updates on that one. If you do find it interesting, don't forget to drop me a big fat like, subscribe for many more, and as always, happy investing.